Thousands of Americans suffer from osteoarthritis, a general wearing out of the hip, causing severe pain. The average age for a hip replacement used to be 68. However, due to new advances in technology, younger patients can benefit from hip replacement surgery. You are about to see a live webcast of a minimally invasive total hip arthroplasty with large head metal on metal articulation performed by surgeons from Sinai Hospital's Rubin Institute for Advanced Orthopedics in Baltimore, Maryland. We've made this from a procedure that, um, that was only done in older patients, that was only done when uh, the hip was completely worn out, to one that is more of a lifestyle choice. Patients that are really limited by their pain, that have things that they want to do they can't do, we're now able to treat them at a younger age uh, before they're, they're incapacitated by their pain. What I've marked out here is the greater trochanter. So uh, for some orientation reasons, the head is to this end of the screen, the foot is toward that end of the screen, and our incision is going to be slightly posterior to the posterior aspect of the femur. It's three inches long, and as you can see, it's tilted back about 25 degrees. Now if I flex the hip, that incision will be straight along the fibers of the gluteus maximus. So knife, please. Now with any kind of small incision, we have to be very careful about hemostasis because even a little bit of blood is going to obscure our field. So we're going to be very careful to get all the bleeders in the fat and in the subcutaneous tissue. If you have a patient that's very large, you can use a spinal needle to identify the greater trochanter before you start. And maybe we have a self-retainer. Now, in the larger patient, finding the fascia can actually be somewhat difficult. And one thing you can do is kind of aim toward the anterior aspect of the leg somewhat so that it, you don't get lost in the fat behind the femur. So at this point, I can start to feel where the fascia meets the fat. And we don't really need to strip too much off of the fat other than to find where the tip of the trochanter is. Now distal to the end of the incision, there is some fascia lot of approximately, this layer is almost completely comprised of the maximus. And again, with a small incision, it's very important to use your electrocautery on the muscle layer so that you don't get bleeders in the muscle that are hard to bovie later on. Now at this point, we've made a split in the maximus. And split our fascia distally. You don't have to go very far past the end of your skin incision. In general, your fascial incision is only a little bit bigger than your skin incision. Okay. Your now, of we've approach. developed a retractor that can be used very nicely in a small incision. It's a, it's a variation of a Coros retractor. Let's go ahead and stuff that for a moment. 
Um, so let's have that bionic chorus retractor there. And um, this is very similar to what's used for a lot of spine surgery. There are a number of different sized blades that we can attach to this. Barry, how do you determine your choice of approach? Well, we, we have an interesting approach. When we're, when we're dealing with a patient that's younger, that we're using an alternative bearing, such as metal on metal, we generally use a posterior approach. And the combination of a large head and metal on metal, I think, is appropriate for the younger patient. We can do a small amount of muscle dissection. And because of the large head, we're not as concerned about dislocation as we would be with a standard posterior approach. For your older patient, uh, again, to try to cut down the dislocation risk, we use an anterior lateral approach, also with a mini type incision, and um, use standard polyethylene. And uh, so that allows us to sort of match the components of the patient and also match the, the procedure and the approach. Okay, um, now at this point we're looking at the posterior aspect of the trochanter. There's usually a bursa covering it which we have to be careful with because the sciatic nerve is right behind it. And if this bursa is teased off, we can see the posterior aspect of the trochanter much more easily. Now at this point, what we'd like to do is identify the piriformis, because that's going to show us where our approach is going to proceed. Uh, I think the 2A retractor. So we've developed a, a thin Hohmann retractor that can be used underneath the abductors and over the capsule. And this will help us identify our piriformis. We have a question that's come in. Is, uh, the, mm -hmm. is the MIS procedure more expensive than the traditional approach? That's an excellent question, and um, at least the way we uh, build the procedure and uh, the way we present it to insurers know it does not cost any more than a standard procedure. It may actually be less expensive because our patients can leave the hospital somewhat sooner. There have been some efforts across the country to charge more for it, uh, but we have not done so. So again, we're teasing this bursa off the external rotators. And the main thing we want to find again is that piriformis, which is going to show us exactly where to make our capsular incision. Another question's come in that I can answer. Someone has asked if they could please send a copy of today's webcast on minimally invasive total hip arthroplasty. And actually, this will be available, available on the web for the next year. Uh, at this same site. What we'd like to see at this point, again, is, is the piriformis and the external rotator. So I'm not sure if you can see it well on the camera, but I'm staring right at the piriformis tendon. Now, one of the most important things to do is to leave it as long as possible because we're going to be repairing it later on. So we're going to make an incision releasing the external rotators and the capsule as one sleeve. And one of the things that will be very helpful is internally rotating the leg. And that will allow us to 
keep the rotator as long as possible. We're going to preserve the quadratus, and that's going to help our stability later on. So we release the capsule in the piriformis, then we're going to make a T-shaped incision just superior to the piriformis. I have another question coming in about the retractors. Mm -hmm. They want to know if these retractors are commercially available. These, these particular retractors are made by Biomet. There are similar sets that are made by other companies. And here's our hip, we're going to dislocate it right now. So here's our hip dislocated. <coughs> Excuse me. The, um, the retractors are uh, very, very helpful. As you can tell, there. for those of you who are familiar with the surgery, they are modifications of the standard type retractors. But they're much thinner and they're very helpful that they've been developed especially for this procedure. This particular retractor is a curved dished um, elevator that's intended to go around the neck and protect the sciatic nerves. So we're going to do that right now. And this goes all the way around the neck so that we know we protected things underneath where we're going to be sawing. There's always a little bit of rotator and a little bit of capsule still attached to the neck, so we're going to clean up the neck so we can see that well. And you're planning on tagging the capsule for later repair? Um, we do repair it later on, although it's not tagged right now. Uh, because the incision is so small, it's very hard to have sutures hanging out of the wound. So what we do is we leave the rotators attached to the capsule, and that prevents them very nicely from retracting. Now, one of the things we all you know, have a problem with with hip replacement is leg length. And with a small incision, we can't see our normal landmarks. So what we've done is we've developed a system where we measure the femur. So I'm going to mark the center of rotation of the humeral head. And we're going to measure down to where our cut line is going to be. So we, we templated ahead of time that our cut line should be 35 millimeters below the center of rotation. And we can try to reproduce that in vivo. And you can determine that using your preoperative x-rays. Correct. And then we can also remeasure it once we've actually removed this from the patient. We're using the, um, the taper lock thermal component, which is a tapered titanium stem. Um, it does not require any kind of L cut. So the femoral head, uh, the neck cut can be made um, in a straight line. So we remove the head, and we can re measure that 35 millimeters. And we find that that is um, maybe 36 or 37 millimeters. You commented on your choice of stem. Can you tell us a little bit about how you go about <laughs> selecting your stem? Excuse me. Um, we use uh, the tapered titanium stem essentially for, for all patients. And we found this works well in um, door A, B, and C, um, in osteoporotic bone, in uh, thicker bone, in younger patients. Uh, there's no collar, so it can be placed very easily. And uh, it's basically a, um, just a broken system. There's, no, there's one hand ream. So it's very simple and very forgiving, especially in a small incision. The fact that you don't have to ream certainly uh, it saves an extra element uh, when you're doing a minimally invasive procedure, preserves uh, the muscle and skin from trauma. Yeah, and that's, we found this very helpful. Now, this is basically a bent homin. We're going to put this behind the acetabulum, and we're going to place this very carefully, it's blunt so that we don't damage any of the neural tissue. Now, So we have that in place posterior. Now the abductors can certainly get in your way. And what we tend to do is put a spike into the ilium. And this is going to help retract the abductors and also prevent them from getting damaged by reamers or other, other instruments. I have another question that's come in. Uh, patients having their hip replaced very soon. and. Uh, they weigh 250 pounds. Does that weigh into any difference in how you would do this surgery? Um, we, we, we've actually found that we can do this mini approach in, in very large patients. We've done patients up to 350 pounds. Do another homin. Um, 
so we can often use the same approach. Now, the nice thing about this posterior type approach is it, it's based on a standard approach that most surgeons are familiar with. And if they need to make the approach bigger to see a little better or they don't feel comfortable with the approach, they can modify it very easily. They don't have to do anything that's, that they're not used to. Do this a little bit. That's actually an important point in that in the learning curve, when you're learning the procedure, your bailout option is the conventional approach that you're very familiar with. Exactly. And um, again, as I mentioned earlier, we use an anterior lateral approach in a lot of patients because for the same reason that we can always extend it. Now, sometimes it's helpful to release the inferior capsule, and that also helps you get your femur a little more anterior. So we're doing that right now. So we don't have to excise it, but we're, we're releasing it a bit. Um, long knife and pickups. Now we're going to remove the labrum. And this is going to give us an excellent view of our acetabulum. One of the other questions I can try to field is how this procedure is different from the MIS single incision anterior approach. Um, essentially, um, through a posterior approach, you're going uh, and releasing the external rotators and uh, taking down the capsule. With an anterior approach, you're actually uh, going through your gluteus medius and minimus tendons and using that for a later repair. Uh, that's the fundamental difference in the approach. Uh, um, do you have any other comments on that, Gary? Yeah, you know, unfortunately, there's no, there's no approach that completely spares every muscle. Um, the external rotators that are released in, in this particular approach are very small. And because we're leaving the quadratus intact, which is another external rotator, uh, most patients have, have no limp and really don't have any problem with trying to rehab them. With the anterior lateral approach, um, we do it so far anterior that, that we haven't had a problem with limping or with the repair failing. Um, with the two incision type techniques, um, while no muscles are directly cut, there are a number of them that are, that are either retracted heavily or, or are you know, somewhat split during, you know, in, a, in a blind fashion. So, so every, every approach has to do some small amount of damage to the muscles, but it, it's truly minimized with these approaches. Yeah, the, the, um, in, in terms of the, the patient selection, the patients that we actually find are, are the hardest to do are those that are um, uh, pretty uh, large um, top, are, are muscular men. So if we have a large muscular man, they can be very difficult to get the muscles out of the way. And, um, and, and we find that we really have to use a lot of retraction. So those are the ones that are the most difficult. I think that's an imp important point for whatever approach you try, whether it's a two incision, a mini anterior, mini or posterior, you definitely don't want to be uh, learning this procedure on large muscular males. Right. Some of the people who are, say, you know, older without as much muscle tone, who are larger, um, really don't present too much of a problem. And um, our patient today, while she while she's uh, thin, does have um, you know a fair amount of tissue on the side of her hip here. So, uh, and that hasn't really presented much of a problem to us. So at this point, we're looking at her acetabulum, and hopefully the camera can see that, and we have an excellent view of it. Now, the reason why this has been a problem in the past is that we couldn't get a, a, a reamer in there because of the handle. So what, what Biomed has developed is a curved reamer with um, a handle on one side and an atraumatic reamer. So you can see that there are no teeth around the outside here. And this can be put into a small incision without tearing the muscle and tissues as it's inserted. So let's take that out. And this is a, a 44 reamer. We're going to ream medially first. And we're trying to remove just the cartilage. Let's have a 46, please. And you can look, but you can also feel. So it's important to reach inside and feel the cartilage, see how much you've taken off. Let's suck in there a little bit. So we have a nice bed of bleeding bone there. And now we can start to make our, our concentric hole here somewhat bigger. As minimally invasive surgery has evolved, they've really come up with a very neat set of custom instruments that are designed for you know, surgeon comfort, but at the same time really make every effort to allow you to do everything very effectively through a mini incision and minimize your soft tissue trauma. What do you 
Um, yeah, and these, these uh, reamers, while they do take some getting used to, are actually fairly easy to use. And I use them even when I'm doing revision or some larger procedure, because I find them easy to use. Now, these teeth are pretty aggressive. And when you start to get into a lot of bone, they will catch. So that's something you do have to get used to. Uh, when they do catch, you just have to release the pressure on it a little bit, like that. <laughs> I actually got in a question from one of the surgeons in our audience <laughs> asking you to comment uh, on resurfacing procedures. Well, um, actually here at the Rubin Institute, we, we do a, a large amount of resurfacing. And um, at this point, I, I don't personally feel that the indications have been well, well described yet. Um, the, uh, the femoral components, I think, still have a problem with fracture, even though that's, that's being you know, heavily worked on. Um, in terms of instrumentation. Um, just biomechanically, I, I believe that you're putting a lot of stress on the femoral neck, which is, of course, the weakest part of the neck. And lastly, most of the resurfacing procedures involve using cement. And um, I believe that if we're trying to find a, a, a total hip that's going to last for 30 or 40 years, I'd really rather not have cement in the, in the construct. Actually, Dr. Barron uh, brings up a good point that you put in a tapered titanium stem with 97% survivorship at 15 years, combine that with a metal on metal, same size head and same cup of resurfacing, then you have a pretty effective procedure. Right, and, and I think most surgeons now would agree that we're seeing more failures on the, on the acetabular side with polyethylene rather than on the femoral side with a tapered stem. So I think, uh, it, it's a very promising technology, but at this point, I think it's somewhat a procedure in search of an indication. So we have a very nice hemispherical hole here, and we're going to trial this. Now, we ran to a 50, and we're going to put in a 50 trial. Our 50 trial has small ridges around it that make it a little bit bigger, so we're going to get the feel for what a 52 would be like if we put in a real 52. So here's our curved inserter, and you can see these ridges around the trial that are going to help us get some fixation there. Now, if we wanted to, we could leave this in and trial right on the inner surface of this trial. And you generally like to under-ream. Yes, yeah, so we're under-reaming by two with this particular shell. Okay, now it. So at that point, we can look at our fixation. If you'd like, you can take the handle off. You can bang down a little bit more. You can take the handle off. You can look and make sure that the cup is down all the way. This is a monoblock cup. So once you put the real cup in, you can't see behind it. Uh, but we have excellent fixation. Our, our pelvis is moving with our trial. It's down, and we can see that it's actually sitting on the, on the subchondral bone. So at this point, if you feel comfortable, you can actually put in the true implant, which is what we're going to do. Please leads us to our next question. Do you have any concerns about ions using a metal-on-metal -metal articulation? Yeah, it's an excellent question. Um, the, the, the data from Europe, which is, is the strongest, looking at metal-on-metal -metal articulations over, over probably almost a 40-year period, have, have really shown that there, there's no increased cancer risk. As a matter of fact, some of the studies actually show that, it, that, that a hip replacement is somewhat protective. Uh, that, may, that may be just a, a side effect of having slightly healthier patients. But at this point, there's no clinical evidence the ion um, issue is, is a problem at all. Uh, if you look at the amount of ions that are released, it may be 8 to 10 times the normal amount of chromium ions. However, there are many other circumstances where uh, humans are exposed to much, much higher levels, 10 to 20 times higher than that, uh, without any adverse effects. So we don't believe that over the course of somebody's lifetime, the amount of chromium is going to be an issue. We need a 52. We try. We ran to a 50, so we need a 52 shell. This is actually a good question. Um, uh, <coughs> does changing the angle of your incision one way or the other help more or less with either help with the acetabulum or the femur? Uh, that's an excellent question. Uh, the more distal the incision, the easier the acetabulum is. The more proximal the incision, the easier the femur is. 
And as you'll see with this procedure, the femur is actually harder than the acetabulum because the, the uh, tissue proximally gets in the way of elevating the femur. So if you have a larger patient, um, that's where you're going to cheat your incision is proximally. So this is a very interesting device. This is, um, uh, again, a metal on metal monoblock cup. It happens to be uh, called the Magnum. Um, and the, uh, the outer shell is about three millimeters in diameter. So the inner shell, um, for this particular shell, it's a 52, and the inner diameter is going to be a 46. So we're actually going to put a 46 head on, which is a really dramatic difference from what we've done in the past. So these heads are actually graduated to larger and larger sizes based on the acetabulum. And the larger head is going to have two advantages. One is, in the metal and metal situation, it's going to lead to less wear. Secondly, um, we're going to have a less of a dislocation risk because of the large head and also because of the jump height is much higher. Let's have a Homan. Homan? Thanks. So again, with a small incision after you've trialed, it's important to make sure that you removed all the tissue from around the rim. Because there may be some small amounts of tissue or labrum that are either dragged in or out by the trial. So we've got some very small pieces of periosteum here that we're just removing to make sure that our, our cup fits the way we expect it to. Another question is, what is specific about this particular system you're using, which is a Biomet system, that makes it preferable to other systems? Well, there, there are a large number of systems out there that, that are excellent. Um, this particular one um, is the only one I know of that has a graduated head size, which is very nice. Um, but certainly, there are a number of very good systems out there, and many of them are, are will, will you know, obtain excellent clinical results. So, so we've inserted our, our shell here, and um, we've gotten the uh, soft tissue out of the way. Now, in terms of our version, we have a, uh, an antenna that we can put on top of the femur and aim at the correct direction. So this is in line with the patient's body. I'm pointing it sort of right at her shoulder. And what I'm looking for here is actually about 30 to 35 degrees aversion. Now, the standard cup should be about 25 degrees anaverted. But because the patient is um, leaning slightly over the table, because it's a posterior approach, we're going to obtain a little more aversion um, than you'd normally expect, and it should come out, you know, about 25 degrees. Now, in terms of the abduction angle, um, our upright is slightly tilted down toward the patient's foot, and the reason for that is that the um, the leg is hanging down, and again, it's pulling the pelvis down a little bit. So we want this at 45 degrees, and if it's leaning slightly down, we're going to obtain that 45 degree angle. Um, now, Dr. Lesko is going to start banging this. So go ahead. And we're going to stop right there. Now, this particular inserter needs to be rotated out. So we're going to try to remove it by rotating it, and that's going to make it somewhat smaller and help to release it. So we're basically going to finish impacting the cup. Question came in about commenting on different types of bearing surfaces. Why use a metal on metal versus a ceramic on ceramic or a highly crosslinked polyethylene? Um, that's another excellent question. The, um, Uh, the ceramic and ceramic is very promising and I think is, is probably an excellent choice. However, surgically, it presents us with um, uh, fewer options. Um, there are fewer neck lengths available. If there's any scratching or any problem with the, um, the, either the taper or the actual component, then we're going to have um, a great deal of difficulty revising it. Um, if it does shatter, which of course is very rare, but it's still a problem, um, you really have a hip that's basically full of glass, and it's very, very hard to revise. Uh, lastly, the heads aren't quite as large, so you really have to get a very large 
acetabular component in there to get a large head. So with this particular system, if we put in a 48 shell, we can put in a 42 head. Whereas with a lot of ceramic systems, we need, for example, a 56 shell just to put in a 36 head. In terms of highly linked um, uh, polyethylene, again, I think it's a, a promising technology. However, um, I think the, the wear data and the in vivo uh, performance hasn't exactly uh, matched each other. And at this point, I think there's still some questions about whether that's going to turn out to be any better than standard polyethylene. So if you can see the component at this point, we have it in place. It's very stable. We like the version. We like the opening. And we're going to go ahead and remove our retractors. So let's have the uh, key handle. And we're going to start working on the, on the femur. Now, as I said before, the femur is actually the harder part of the procedure. So we're going to internally rotate the thigh. And we have, let's have the number three right, oh, sorry, left. It's very important uh, to have retractors that uh, optimize your visualization, but also protect the surrounding muscles. Exactly. So what we have here is an offset retractor. This little curve here is going to go behind the acetabulum. And then this offset area here is going to protect our quadratus and prevent it from getting damaged by the reamer. And then over here we have a curved dish retractor. And again, that's going to allow us to elevate our femur and also put our instruments down without damaging the soft tissue or the skin. Boy, that really does a nice job. Let's, uh, let's switch places here, Eric, if you don't mind. Okay, so I'm going to come up here. And again, we often have, we often have some uh, soft tissue left here, which is essentially parts of the capsule. So um, let's have a pickup, please. And we're going to go ahead and remove some of that. And you can use this uh, procedure for cementing just as easily. Yeah, and that's the nice thing about it. Uh, a lot of the two incision techniques, it's pretty hard to use cement because you can't see the calcar real well. Uh, but that's a very good point. In this procedure, you can really see the calcar. It's right here. Um, we've got to protect it. If we put cement in, we can get our cement out pretty easily. So let's have the uh, hand reamer, please. So this is a, a, a thin hand reamer. Uh, I do this by hand so that we don't put it out through the femur anywhere. And that's going to help us find our canal. Um, if, if you can lateralize at this point, uh, that helps, but you certainly don't have to. That's one of the nice things about this stem, right? <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, now, of course, we try to put it in straight, but if it were in varus or valgus, it does not affect the long-term outcome or the viability of the stem. I think it, that's a nice thing to, to think about, because with uh, a lot of the other approaches where you may be uh, using a full-coat stem, it's very, very important to get lateral and it's also uh, critical to uh, assess your uh, antiversion right off the bat. Um, whereas with this stem, it's much more um, friendly, user-friendly for a minimally invasive type of technique. Um, yeah, it is very user-friendly. And again, with this approach, I can see the entire proximal femur. I can see my antiversion. I can see laterally. So it's very easy for me to put this in the correct version, the correct, the correct amount of lateralization. So what we're looking for here is to have the, the prosthesis down to our cut line. Uh, we're looking for axial stability, so when I bang it, it shouldn't move. And lastly, we're looking for rotational stability. And with this component, the real easy thing about it is, as soon as it's rotationally stable, you're, you're at your correct size. Another question that's come in is, is there true that there's a higher infection rate with minimally invasive versus a traditional approach? I think we, uh, you definitely have to be concerned about infection when you're stretching out soft tissues, particularly uh, in older patients. Uh, you can certainly uh, lead to an earlier uh, wound dehiscence, and you have to be very careful about um, uh, 
significant soft tissue and subcutaneous tissue trauma, as well as skin trauma when you're reaming and, and broaching. Uh, so uh, as long as you pay attention to these details, there shouldn't necessarily be a higher rate of infection. <laughs> yes, excuse me. Um, I think a lot of it's also related to the length of the procedure. I think you know most data would show that the length of procedure is, is you know correlated to the infection rate. And because with this mini approach, we don't have to worry about fluoro, we don't have to worry about uh, doing a great deal of positioning that's you know above and beyond the normal amount. Um, we're able to keep the operative time to under an hour. So uh, at this point, we have our trial in. Now, we've already trialed that we're going to use a standard neck. There's a lateralized neck in this particular system. So let's have a standard neck, please. And we've also trialed that a, that a negative 6 neck will be the correct neck length. So we need a negative 6 by 52. Take this out. So here's the trial. And you can see this is a very large head. It looks like a bipolar. And most surgeons, when they first see this, are pretty, pretty surprised at how large the head is. Barry, do you find that uh, with using a larger head, you can take a little bit more generous of a neck cut to not only help with visualization, uh, but also to uh, facilitate uh, the femoral preparation in that the larger head is actually, in a sense, gaining more neck length. So you can go to a, a minus six and with a comfortable neck length. To yeah, help. That's exactly right. You don't have to worry necessarily about the, um, the head-neck ratio because this head is so large that our neck can't impinge on anything. So we've got about 70 degrees of internal rotation and the head is still located. She extends nicely. We're going to look at our external rotation and adduction. It doesn't come out there. And just in terms of the, there's no shuck. And then also to look at her leg length, we can also test her clinically. And we kind of marked out her foot before the surgery and we can see that her foot is in the same place it was before. And lastly, we can measure that same measurement we did earlier, looking at, please have a ruler, please. Looking at how much femur we've added. So I'm, I'm measuring from our cut line to the center of rotation, and that measures almost exactly 37. So we're pretty confident that we've, we've matched the leg length here. So we're going to open the true femur at this point. A question has come in about um, whether you prefer doing a two incision technique to this or what you feel the benefits and, and disadvantages of that are. Yeah, I've really found that our results with this incision have been, have been just so excellent without an increased complication rate that you see with the two incision that I have not felt the need to, to do any two incision hips. Uh, although I've, I've participated in a lot of research on it and I've also witnessed it a lot of times. Um, at least in my hands, this approach looks so well that we're really using it as our standard approach for the younger patient. So at this point, we're going to put our true prosthesis in. Um, these particular brooches, which are fairly new, they're called the exact brooches. And they, they've really been calibrated to the size of the implant I believe much better than implants in the past. And this has really allowed us to be very confident that the implant is going to end up right where the brooch did. Um, in the past, a lot of surgeons have probably noted that their implant didn't always end up exactly where they thought. And it's most likely not due to surgical error, but really due to the fact that the brooches weren't too consistent. This type of implant is definitely becoming the gold standard for minimally invasive procedures regardless of approach. Yeah, and, and every manufacturer has a similar implant. The taper lock has been essentially unchanged for about 20 years now. And um, uh, if you can see, it's grid blast approximately. Um, it's tapered distally. This is smooth, not intended to ingrow. And the nice thing about the mini incision is we can put this in. And to a certain extent, if our version is off by a little bit, it will, let's take the center. Um, it, will, it will go right back where the brooch went in terms of the version. So it's very easy to put in. We can watch it under direct vision. And the other thing is, you know, as the uh, patient population becomes younger and younger, you know, you have to consider uh, the longevity of your uh, bone in addition to your prosthesis. And with a proximal fitting stem, Open the head. you're less likely to have um, a stress shielding response and, and bone resorption over time.
So um, again, we're going to open up a negative six neck with a um, 46 millimeter um, head diameter. And, and again, this, you know, it takes some getting used to it. It looks a lot like a bipolar or a unipolar. Um, because we're using the shortest neck length, which is, which is a negative six, um, we're certainly not going to need a different uh, implant because that, that's the smallest one there is. So our, we're happy with our neck length, we're happy with our leg length, and we're going to go ahead and put in the real implant. And you can see that this, this implant really went right back down where our brooch was. So uh, we're very confident that our, our measurements are going to be maintained here. You can see there's really minimal soft tissue trauma. Yeah, it's truly amazing. Our chordratus is completely intact. Our abductors um, are really out of the field the entire case. And you've done this procedure in some 300 plus pound individuals with similar size incision. Yeah, it's really been amazing. And, and I, I, you know, occasionally we've made the incision as large as four or five inches, but uh, we don't have anybody that we've had to actually go larger than five inches. So, um, you know, while the skin incision itself is not really important, the um, the muscle exposure is, and, and we've really been able to do this in, in almost almost every kind of patient. And unfortunately, unlike some approaches like the two incision, um, not every patient is, is a good candidate for it. Um, and almost every can, almost every patient can have this type of approach, which is really nice. I think that's an important point. There are definitely uh, some minimally invasive procedures out there where there are clear um, indications and contraindications. So there's the head, and I hope I hope you can see that on the camera because it's. It's very impressive. It's uh, very large, and it's almost as big as the whole incision. So there's our head, and we're going to go ahead and reduce it now. One of the questions that's come in is, um, if you're at a minus six, um, uh, what's your bailout if it's too tight? And actually, I believe there's uh, some smaller neck sizes coming out of minus nine. Yeah, uh, let's hold it right there, Joe. So at this point, we're going to look at our articulation. So here, here's the head. And um, you can see it actually in the shell. You may not be able to see it on the camera, but in the shell, it really has excellent version. Let me see if I can just move some of this muscle out of the way so you can see it a little better. And again, we can go into quite a large amount of version, uh, a large amount of internal location without it coming out. There's really no impingement there. So that's basically the whole procedure. And, and again, you know, even though obviously we're taking a little extra time doing the filming and, and talking about the procedure, um, uh, that, that took us you know, approximately 50 minutes to do the whole thing. So we're going to do some irrigation right now and begin closing. Now, as I mentioned earlier, the capsule can be reapproximated a number of ways. You can uh, reapproximate it to itself, which essentially involves just um, sewing it together, and then acts as a posterior sleeve. Um, you can sew it through drill holes through the posterior aspect of the greater trochanter, which I've gotten away from doing with the large head. We haven't felt the need to do that. But you certainly can repair that fairly easily. Um, and the other thing we're using is a platelet grafting system. Uh, this particular one is called GPS. It's from a company called Cell Factor Technology. Uh, but there are similar systems um, that are available. And what we do is we take approximately 60 cc's of blood, we spin that down and take out a platelet concentrated plasma, which has eight to 10 times the normal amount of uh, uh, platelets in it. And at least in our initial series, we've been doing this about a year now, we've really seen the wounds healing quicker with less drainage. And it's allowed us to stop using drains. We've been using a subcutaneous suture. And the other nice side effect is that the patients can shower much earlier on than they used to. I put up a slide of your transfusion rate, 14% in your series of 280 patients. Yeah, and I think over the last couple of, uh, uh, the last year or so, it's been even lower. So at some point, we're, we'd like to separate out the, the um, patients who've received the uh, platelet-rich plasma. And you, you, are, um, you do this for the knees as well, and in fact, you're not using a drain now at this point for either hips or knees? That's correct. So from, for, again, for the knee and for the hip, um, we've really had uh, really higher hematocrits and wounds that don't heal, uh, that seem to heal quicker and also much less um, 
uh, a lower uh, rate of. Um, let's go ahead and relocate that. Um, a much lower rate of uh, hematomas. A lot of growth factors. Correct. Okay. So in terms of closing, we're just going to take the leg and, and abduct it a bit and put it up on our mayo stand. And in a moment, we're going to go ahead and put our platelet-rich plasma in. So the first thing I'm going to do is just reapproximate our capsule. And again, we can very easily reapproximate the two leaves of it. This is an interesting question. Are you finding that you're using negative tapers more than standard or positive tapers in MIS surgery? Yeah, yeah, we are. Um, and I think there's two reasons. One, of course, is that our nut cuts are probably a little smaller than in the past. And secondly, because with a larger head, uh, the head itself is longer. So it does, uh, it does actually give you a little more height with the head itself. So yeah, we're using a lot more, more commonly using a negative um, neck length. And uh, again, with a larger head, that's not as much of an issue as it was in the past because we're not concerned with the, um, the neck actually hitting the, the S-tabulum. I think if you take a little bit lower neck cut, it actually gets you more coaxial with your shaft when you're preparing the femur. Uh, that's, yeah, that's exactly right. So here's our, here's our platelet-rich plasma. And when you first you know, use this, it kind of just looks like blood, but it's mixed with thrombin. It actually sticks to the tissues and um, really seals them up. And if you think about it, you know, why do you get edematous and why do you get drainage? And the main reason is because those tissues aren't sealed. They're, they're traumatized, the uh, cells are leaking, the capillaries are leaking. And if you can seal it up with something that's going to clot very rapidly, then you can get sort of a more normal tissue environment in there. And of course, the other nice byproduct is that closing the wound is very easy. What's your uh, normal uh, post-operative uh, rehabilitation plan? When are they up and about? Um, many of our patients actually are up the night of surgery. Uh, because it's so late today, um, our patient today is going to get up tomorrow morning. But all of our patients um, are at least ambulating by post-up day one. And even, even if we take all comers, our 80-year-olds, our 90-year-olds, um, more than 50% of them are going home at post-up day two or three. So I'm gonna, we're gonna just going to finish closing the fascia, and um, we're certainly not going to make everybody watch us close the skin, but one thing I would like to show you in just a moment is the skin itself. Uh, because, again, with these, with these newer retractors, one of the main problems we had when I first started using this procedure with standard retractors was that the skin would be damaged or the, uh, the muscle layer would be damaged. And at this point, If you look at our incision, it isn't stretched out. The proximal part of the skin here, you can see, is undamaged. And, and, and that's something that's really dramatically different than we used to see in the past. There's a question about GPS that's come in. Uh, is there an increased rate of heterotopic ossification using GPS? Uh, that's a good question. We haven't seen that. Um, it may be because we're doing a poster approach. Uh, but we, ha we haven't seen it clinically yet. That's number one, so we'll use number two there. Yeah, so th if, if I could just emphasize a few things, um, the, the, the posterior aspect of the approach, uh, the approach is, is really nice because, again, most surgeons are familiar with it. It's relatively easy to do. It doesn't make the uh, operative time longer and increase our, our infection risk. Um, we're able to use this very large head, which is going to cut down our dislocation rate. And we can do a posterior approach without worrying about the traditional higher dislocation rate. 
Uh, the tapered stem is easy to put in for a mini incision. Um, it has excellent ingrowth because of the titanium and the tapered aspect of it. Um, because it's essentially a square peg in a round hole, it gets excellent fixation um, almost wherever you put it. So if it gets some proximal fixation, even if it gets distal, if the whole stem has three-point fixation, um, it gets excellent ingrowth. Uh, so it's taken a lot of the guesswork and a lot of the worry out of this procedure. So we're going to close this with um, a monocryl momentarily. And I'd say the average amount of time for our patients to shower at this point is four days. Many of them can even shower three days. Are there any final comments on post-operative pain management and DVT prophylaxis? That's, that's an excellent question. We, we've, been doing, we've been trying to be very progressive about post-operative pain management. We've been using Cox, we've been using, uh, COX-2 inhibitors, particularly Celebrex and, Bio, and, um, and uh, Bextra. We've been um, using a lot of blocks. We use femoral blocks and uh, lumbar plexus blocks. We've been, um, and that's what allowed us to cut down on narcotic usage uh, tremendously. Um, for DVT prophylaxis, we've been using Arixtra, which is a, um, uh, a pentasaccharide. It's an artificial sort of version of heparin. Um, and, and with that, we've seen a lot less wound drainage. So the problems people have seen with low molecular weight heparins in the past, we haven't been quite as worried about in terms of uh, uh, the wound healing. So that's really been a big advance also. So all these things have helped us cut down on the complications and make things more reliable. You have a quick ruler to that? Sorry? You have a quick ruler on that? So here's, here's, our, here's our ruler. Let's see if we can put it straight up. Excuse me, Eric. So it's three inches, it's probably three and a half inches at this point, a little stretched out. And when it heals, it's going to be exactly three inches long. And here's the rest of our uh, platelet-rich plasma. And we're going to put that right into the wound. And actually, we're going to put some of our platelet-poor plasma right on top of the wound to seal it up.